Good morning and a uh, good day to uh, all of you. Thank you very much uh, for joining uh, this webinar today. Uh, so this webinar from Enodata uh, will focus on the green hydrogen production and will uh, co-present uh, myself. I'm Fabrice Poulain. I'm the clean tech unit manager inside Enodata. And uh, I will present with uh, my fellow worker, uh, Maël Gore. Uh, that it, it will introduce the next slides. Moving on to uh, what we do at Enodata. So we are basically a company, uh, independent research company uh, founded in 1991. We're an expert in analysis and forecasting of global energy and sustainability issues. And we act in four key areas that are highlighted on this slide, market intelligence, data science, uh, modeling and uh, expert, uh, expertise in energy and climate issues. Uh, in particular, we are working on hydrogen and we have a team dedicated on this uh, domain uh, in, inside Enodata. Moving on to what we will uh, discuss today, the agenda. So we will uh, focus here on what we call green hydrogen and electrolysis in particular. Uh, and so we will introduce those concepts and then we will move on to uh, the forecasting and the method we have uh, basically unfolded into an upcoming report on electrolyzer production. Basically, uh, we will be able to uh, indicate the forecast figures uh, up to 2030. Uh, of course, electrolyzer is one thing and electrolyzer is generating hydrogen. So we'll, of course, uh, make the link with the hydrogen production in terms of tons uh, per uh, year in particular. And uh, to conclude, we'll move on with, in particular, the European Union objective in this domain of hydrogen production and uh, confirm or not uh, what are the trends in uh, this domain? Are we in line with the objective uh, regarding the trends uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the, that we have identified? Uh, so now I'm uh, giving uh, the microphone to Mael, and he will uh, keep on on the side. Thank you, Fabrice, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, to introduce this presentation on hydrogen produced from electrolysis using renewable electricity, also called green hydrogen. I will start with... Um, state of the art of how hydrogen was produced in 2020 and how it was used. During this year, uh, hydrogen was mainly used for um, industrial applications, uh, ammonia production and refineries. On the graph here, uh, we can see that 90 million tons of hydrogen were produced in total, uh, including uh, byproducts. Um, this figure from the International Energy Agency highlights uh, the production mode of hydrogen, which rely heavily on natural gas and coal. This fossil fuel usage uh, is resulting in 900 million tons of CO2 emissions uh, during the 2020 year. Uh, it is a very important figure regarding the global emissions of the pandemic year which account for such 1.5 gigatons. So the production of hydrogen today have important consequences. Um, and as we need to reduce emissions across all sectors uh, to meet our climate goals, we also need to uh, reduce emissions associated with hydrogen production and change uh, the way it is produced today. So it is required to change uh, hydrogen, how hydrogen is produced. You can see here the whole value chain um, of the hydrogen sector. And today we'll only focus on the electrolyzer aspect. Uh, so we'll focus on this equipment, allowing the production of hydrogen from, el from electricity and demineralized water. These equipments are allowing to produce one kilogram of hydrogen uh, using 50 to 55 kilowatt hours of electricity and 9 to 10 liters of demineralized water. And all the figures shown uh, in the next slides are using uh, 
information on uh, companies dedicated that are producing uh, electrolyzers that a branch dedicated to this industry. Um, our methodology was, was um, our methodology was selecting uh, from the Enadata Global Hydrogen Database twelve companies uh, that are producing these electrolyzers and that are identified are, as expecting to dominate um, this market in the next few years, or at least being in this position today. These twelve um, industrial players. Um, are from various regions and they are here shown in three rows. So the first row uh, with Nell, Plug, ITM and McPhee are companies that are producing electrolyzers since um, 10 to 15 years and that are specialized on the hydrogen um, branch. The second row with John Cockhill, Siemens, Thyssen Kupnisa and Cummins uh, are companies that are very diversified and have a very um, significant size compared to the first row and they have a dedicated branch for electrolyzers since also 10 to 15 years. And the third row uh, with Longi, Haldor, Topse, Hydrogen Pro and Omium are companies that are uh, entering this market with emerging technologies or new products uh, since a few years now and are expecting to be in a position to play an important part. So from these 12 companies, uh, we can see that eight of them are from the Europe, from Europe uh, three from the USA and one from China. Uh, they are all producing electrolyzers, but not specifically the same type of technology. So five of them are producing alkaline electrolyzers only. Four of them are producing PEM electrolyzers only. And two of them are producing both. PEM and alkaline electrolyzers. Those equipment um, have um, a different, uh, which is a membrane, uh, which make it alkaline or PEM, but they are both operating at um, low temperature, so below 100 degrees. And this is the most um, mature technology. It is commercially available yet. Uh, and we have selected one company, Hal.Tops, a Danish company producing SOEC electrolyzers, which is operating at a higher temperature over 500 degrees uh, for efficiency gains, is specifically useful in uh, industrial usage. This, uh, this last technology is not yet um, mature and commercial, commercially available. Uh, so using information on these sorts of companies, um, we have uh, looked at uh, them very closely and then an analysis on several types and several aspects of information, financing information, revenues, fundraised, capital structure. We also looked at the technology and products. So which type of technology and what size of electrolyzers are producing because there are various size of electrolyzers for different type of applications. We also looked at production and supply chain aspects. So where are these electrolyzers produced? And what is the supply chain? Where are they made, are produced, but also integrated? Where are, does the company come from? And last, we also looked at um, the sale and projects pipeline uh, aspects. So what is the order backlog or what is the project pipeline of these companies, if available? And also, uh, what are the key projects that these uh, companies are involved in and that are uh, important to them? Uh, with all this information on these companies, we design a summary of existing operating and also plan uh, manufacturing sites for electrolyzers um, from these uh, suppliers. So we have designed um, a list of each site with production capacity for electrolyzers for, from, for each year from 2021 to 2030. And with this in mind, uh, we have uh, estimated the number of electrolyzers output from 2021 up to 2030. So here you can find some of the results from this work. Um, you have the global accumulated production capacity by technology. Here it's shown for alkaline electrolyzers only, meaning that 
the results shown in the blue part, um, in the blue uh, bar for 2030, represents alkaline electrolyzers that will be produced since 2021. So it gives us an idea in terms of uh, electricity input for this equipment in gigawatts, how much of them will be produced from electrolyzers side uh, until 2030. Uh, our report also includes other technologies uh, for um, the different technology presented. Um, some capacities uh, might add to this uh, result uh, because some companies are producing both of them and have expressed um, production capacities on certain sites without detailing uh, whether it would be alkaline or PEM. So this is the alkaline um, that is certain to be produced uh, on this time range. We also uh, design a map of the, all the sites uh, listed uh, with a project status, technology, current capacity, plan, and plan. Uh, so you can get an idea of how uh, each site is evolving. With all this information, we also uh, design uh, we also estimated the cumulated production capacity by region. So here are some results shown for the European region. Um, you can see the electrolyzers output from these selected companies from 2021 to 2030. So Europe uh, is expected to be uh, represent uh, an important share of uh, this market. Uh, with a um, strong ecosystem supporting these companies since now 10 to 12 years. Um, but other regions are also uh, expecting to install electrolyzers and important electrolyzers capacity, uh, such as Asia. So we have here the results for the European region. Um, on all the sites that are announced, some of them uh, don't have a precise location yet. Um, so there is still a part that is considered as undisclosed and when the location will be unveiled, they'll be dispatched to, for example, Asia, Europe or the United States. So some additional capacity might add up uh, in the next, uh, with some further announcements. But to this day, uh, this represents the electrolyzer output for it uh, until the, each year for Europe. We also um, estimated this result with a project status uh, perspective. Uh, you have here different categories uh, for each site. Um, the operational category means that in 2022, electrolyzers are being currently produced uh, in this existing factory. And um, this um, capacity is considered as similar for each year and they add up until uh, 2030. The extensions category comes from the same sites that are operational today, but with uh, e extra capacity, additional capacities with new production lines that are being planned on these sites. From the project perspective, the project category, uh, this represents uh, production capacity located in factories that are considered as project, which means there is a site, there is a location, there is a planned capacity for uh, this factory, but it is not operating yet. And last, the announcement category uh, means that some companies listed uh, in this study have announced production capacity at a date, uh, and they have not uh, expressed uh, yet where uh, this capacity will be uh, located. Uh, so there are still uh, some production sites that needs to be uh, more detailed from these companies. Uh, this is shown in the green category. So with all these informations of the global output of electrolyzers, from uh, these companies, uh, we estimated uh, the global forecast production of hydrogen from a supplier side, meaning how much hydrogen could be produced 
from um, the information we have today on uh, as a company producing electrolyzers. Uh, so using uh, the product de description uh, of uh, the electrolyzers presented by these companies, we estimated the volume of hydrogen in million tons here uh, per year. Uh, meaning that with the purest estimation of electrolyzers, we will produce uh, globally a certain amount of hydrogen for each year. We have here two different categories, uh, two scenarios, 43% utilization rate and 95% electrolyzers utilization rate. This differentiation uh, means that uh, it is not certain yet how uh, what will be the utilization rates of these uh, companies. And so 95% uh, electrolyzers utilization rates uh, means that this equipment will be used 24 seven with only 5% of the time uh, dedicated for maintenance and, rep and reparation. And then there is the 43% scenario uh, that is due to uh, uncertainties on the furniture of electricity of renewable electricity to these electrolyzers um, because there is not yet a clear understanding of how much electricity could be um, transfer um, could be used to produce hydrogen from renewable electricity and it gives us two different value for every year on the global perspective we have also uh, separate uh, this global forecast for several regions, uh, for example, Europe. And we have here uh, the cumulative electrolyzers production capacity in Europe. So in terms of uh, gigawatts, meaning electricity inputs um, going into these electrolyzers. We have worked also on the industrial we have worked until now with uh, industrial information so we used uh, data from companies producing these electrolyzers our aim was also to compare it with uh, some figures and some targets from uh, institutions as the european the european union that has set a dedicated hydrogen strategy in 2020 uh, with several goals by 2024 six gigawatts of electrolyzers installed in Europe, and by 2030, 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers installed in Europe, with us, um, a certain volume of uh, hydrogen produced uh, using these electrolyzers. So we can see with our results that the forecast for 2024 will be most likely overachieved with the uh, estimations from industrial uh, companies. Uh, but in 2022, with the European Commission EU communication, uh, a new target has been set with 10 million tons of hydrogen produced domestically in Europe and 10 million tons of hydrogen imports by 2030. And according to industry estimate, it will require 140 gigawatts uh, of el installed electrolyzers. So with this in mind, uh, we have seen that in two years only, the target from this region has significantly reached. And it is today quite aligned with estimations of European, uh, of industrial assets in Europe. Uh, some additional assets might uh, come up with the years with the unveiled uh, segment that we presented before. Uh, so we have done a similar type of work on other region with um, our information that we collect. Uh, thank you for listening. I will let now Fabrice uh, conclude. Thank you, Mael. 
so we are reaching at the end of our webinar and wanted to conclude on uh, basically the Inadata offering we have on hydrogen. So just with this uh, single slide, uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. I didn't mention that at the beginning. So feel free to ask questions and we'll answer it right after presenting this slide. Uh, basically, what we presented today is going to be detailed into a report, uh, so the, called the Global Electrolyzer Manufacturing Report, uh, and uh, this will be available at the end of this uh, month. So uh, you have seen uh, some highlights of this report. Of course, there is much more information, much more details available. Uh, uh, so basically, we split uh, this forecast by actor. Uh, we uh, indicate the different technologies. We give a timeline, associated timeline by actor, and so on. So this, this gives the huge amount of extra details. And of course, it has a, a global coverage. So this is the Global Electrolyzer Manufacturing Capacity Report. And so upcoming uh, product, already existing uh, product and services. We have power plant tracker. So this one focuses on assets. So we are talking about power plants, any type of power plants, because it has a global energy coverage. And uh, this uh, power plant tracker is uh, covering uh, any, any type of energy, as I just mentioned, and also electrolysis. That is the focus of the topic today and fuel cells. Uh, third type of uh, database, uh, it's a database including 1,000 companies, and basically we have all the providers, the technology providers in more than uh, 40 countries uh, that are being covered. So we are covering the whole value chain from the components to the system uh, in particular, so electrolyzer being a system for us. And uh, gives detail, of course, of the company, the size, the, the, the different offering, uh, the different technology. And finally, we have also services on the consulting. So uh, we are able to go into uh, market research, uh, in particular for technology innovation. Uh, we do also actor mapping and, and benchmarking and uh, as well due diligence. This is for the Enadata offering. And uh, basically, uh, we uh, can uh, conclude this uh, webinar with the, the, the questions. So uh, once again, feel free to send us uh, a question and maybe I will start with uh, one question I just uh, uh, we received during the, the webinar. Uh, the question is about the technology. Uh, so uh, as Mael introduced, we are seeing many uh, different technologies, uh, at least three to four and more. Uh, and the question is which one is going to lead? So. Uh, today, uh, the, the game is still open, uh, so we have basically uh, some technology that is mainstream, alkaline being, being the most uh, popular today, uh, but PEM is also uh, the big challenger. So uh, today we see mainly a battle between those two technologies. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it will all depend also about the adoption and this will be dependent on the different markets the technology uh, are feeling, uh, fitting with. So basically, some technology fit better with one particular application. Uh, so that's uh, one parameter to consider, uh, to see which one is going to, to take the biggest share of the cake. And the second aspect to consider is the learning curve. Of course, the technology that will be produced in the highest amount will uh, benefit from learning curve effects and economies of scale and will be able to be the most competitive because cost is definitely the big battle for the hydrogen domain. Uh, there are uh, important targets on this field. So that's for this uh, question. Um, looking at the different question we have. Um, so a question from Philippe, will we have enough green electricity to produce such amount of green hydrogen and is indicating that's not sure for him. Um, so, uh, Mael, do you want to take this one? Uh, it is a very good question because it is also a question that uh, companies producing electrolyzers today are asking themselves because they have been supported by a regulatory framework uh, since 
uh, 10 to 15 years now to create a favorable ecosystem to create these companies producing electrolyzers. But uh, they have raised a few billions of private capital investments until now, but there is no clear uh, regulation on what is defined as green electricity entering uh, this equipment. Um, so it, it is quite hard to estimate how much green electricity will enter these electrolyzers because the rules are not still defined. They, uh, these uh, producers were expecting uh, by mid-September um, a new regulation from the Red 2 Delegated Act, but the clear uh, the, the rules are still not clear yet for them. Uh, so it is still a question that needs to be addressed, and it is a very big question for the development of this industry. Uh, so they are urging the parliament to define a clear rule of how they can get electricity from the grid, make sure it's green. Um, does it have to be from their own binding zone or not? But uh, it is a question that needs to be addressed by uh, our institutions also. Then we have a question from Apova Badio. Uh, how much electrolyzers manufacturing is expected to be established in India in its timeline? So we also have information uh, on India uh, with some slides that have been planned by companies present in here. Uh, it is maybe not as mature as in Europe, but for sure a few sites have been ident identified there. And we have worked on the timeline of um, the production capacity increase from, uh, from the Indian perspective. Uh, we also have looked at uh, the Indian national, mission, Indian national hydrogen mission that has been unveiled um, this year only, uh, targeting um, a clear target for India of 5 million tons of hydrogen produced by 2025, I think. Um, do you want to answer to Guillaume Poupi question? Yes, uh, I think uh, the question of Guillaume is related to the previous one you have answered. And uh, but let's com complement it or uh, add some extra details. So basically, there are uh, several questions on, on the electricity that will uh, supply electrolyzer. And, uh, the, and the amount of electricity available for that. So what I wanted just to add on what Mel just answered is uh, basically when there is a design, what we know of the design of the uh, hydrogen electrolysis uh, production plants, there is often a uh, uh, thinking about uh, the type of uh, electricity that will be associated to this electrolyzer and in particular, uh, solar wind energy and uh, so there is a part of the uh, consumption of the electrolyzer that is already integrated at the beginning and of course as the uh, energy this energy is not available 24-24 uh, uh, there is very often backups and the backup is uh, basically taking it from the grid and uh, so that's the, the the challenge that the plant designer have is to balance this uh, take into account the different costs of energy, take into account the mix of electricity also depending on the country. Uh, so uh, in order to generate uh, a fully uh, green uh, hydrogen. So uh, it's, a, it's a complex topic, uh, but uh, renewable electricity and renewable energy directly into uh, plan into the, the project is helping to supply uh, some sites have uh, succeeded to, to secure 100% uh, uh, electricity, and that's typically with one energy we didn't mention, that is hydroelectricity. Uh, so hydroelectricity is allowing to have uh, quite good usage and, and supply of uh, the electrolyzer. So that's for this question. Um, then uh, moving on to another question. Um, uh, from uh, Carl Tang Huang. Uh, what is gray hydrogen? If you want to take this one, Mael. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Fabrice. So I think these questions come from Kao Tang Huang. Um, gray hydrogen is defined as uh, hydrogen produced from uh, processes that are not, that are using fossil fuels. So 
uh, it can be from uh, steam methane uh, reforming or coal uh, gasification. Um, these processes are used uh, very largely today. They are presenting over 95% of hydrogen production and they have uh, heavy CO2 emissions associated. So in order to decrease uh, emissions, um, it is required to also decrease the uh, amount of fossil fuel we use to produce hydrogen, which is also called gray hydrogen, but uh, it is just a name. I have also a question from uh, Apova Badir, another one. What is, expect, what is the expected cost of producing alkaline electrolyzers in India? We also worked on uh, this question. Uh, so we have identified information from uh, companies. Uh, there are no uh, Indian companies listed uh, in this work, but some of the companies have manufacturing assets in India. And uh, we have uh, collected information on uh, the cost or the price of electrolyzers on, or at least the cost of hydrogen produced from uh, electrolyzers in India. Um, a question from Thomas von Dalish. Uh, I am wondering about the intermittence uh, intermittence of the renewable energy. What happens to the electrolyzers? Um, what happens to the electrolyzers plant when the green electricity availability is low and not sufficient for the for the technology? Are we using network electricity or just stop the installation? Um, it is a very good question. I think it's also relating to the first one I've answered and that also Fabrice addressed a few minutes ago. Uh, the rule to call uh, hydrogen green is not clear yet and it is still being worked on. Uh, it is a very big challenge for the development of this industry, uh, maybe specifically in Europe, because some funds will be allocated to purchase uh, green hydrogen, but uh, the re regulatory framework uh, is not yet here. Uh, so the producers of green, green hydrogen uh, today have to build their own uh, renewable assets uh, because they can't use um, XT from the grid uh, up to now uh, in order to, because emissions related uh, to hydrogen production with the average uh, XT mix of Europe uh, has heavy consequences um, of, on CO2 emissions. Um, so it is very important that electricity that enter these equipments has uh, low uh, emissions associated because as this process consumes um, lots of electricity, it is worth using electricity from uh, coal or gas uh, and using electrolyzers than uh, using the classic process today as uh, steam methane reforming, for example. Uh, moving on on the questions. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Mark. Is any of these companies planning a mass production of electrolyzer or is it still manual manufacturing? So uh, there is a double question here. Um, so thank you for this question. The, it's, a, it's a good point indeed. We have, uh, so mass production is happening today. It started, started uh, some time ago, but uh, the existing capacity is here. Uh, the, the second aspect of the question, are we talking about manual assembly or are we talking about automated uh, manufacturing? And this is just starting uh, this second aspect of automatic uh, man automation, basically, uh, into electrolyzer manufacturing line is just starting to happen. Uh, there has been some communication. I think uh, Nell has uh, communicated in particular about uh, an automated factory uh, that uh, they are uh, currently implementing. So uh, this is happening. So question answer to, to those questions is yes, mass production is, is happening. 
uh, and automation is also uh, starting. Um, another question um, from uh, Jaime. Uh, do you want to take this one, uh, Mael? What is your opinion on the 2030 objectives? Are they possible to meet? Yes, sure. Thank you, Fabrice. Um, so if we consider uh, the 2030 objective, it depends on the region. So um, um, sorry. Yes, you can see my screen now. Okay, so let me take this one. Um, so the, the, the opinion on the 20, what is the opinion on the 2030 objective? Uh, so what we demonstrated in this presentation is uh, in particular for Europe, uh, there is everything that is uh, planned uh, to achieve uh, such uh, objective. And uh, the announcement and the uh, uh, existing and extension of the current production facilities are, uh, and this is what we have uh, computed, are in line with those uh, 2030 objectives. Of course, it will depend about uh, the, the ability of those supplier uh, to, uh, to, to basically reach those objectives and uh, be able uh, to uh, invest uh, into the manufacturing capacity. Uh, I think there was another question on, on this uh, point of uh, uh, the capacity. There was another question on what are the main factors uh, uh, helping to achieve uh, the, the, this planned capacity and investment will be key uh, you've seen the various announcements about uh, electrolyzer uh, Giga factories, and those factories are uh, feature uh, significant cost. Um, so we have uh, identified uh, this also into the report. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of several tens of millions of, uh, of uh, euro, depending on what, of course, is inside this uh, manual automated, the size of the factory, etc depending on what we include into the cost, but uh, it's important cost. And the finance of those factory will be key. So, uh, and what will finance, of course, the investors and uh, also the market. And, and uh, provided there is enough demand for those electrolyzer, this will help the manufacturer to secure the investment to increase the capacity of electrolyzers. Um, some other question. Uh, one question from Peter. How much hydrogen do you think there will be used for power generation as opposed to industrial uses? So using hydrogen for electricity production. Huh? Uh, so we're talking about fuel cells, if I uh, understand correctly the question. And uh, the industrial uses uh, is mainly uh, so to do decarbonation and uh, typically what is currently uh, used as a, what we call a gray uh, hydrogen, for example, in refining, uh, petroleum refining. Uh, so today, the, the priority is on decarbonation. Uh, it's about getting rid of gray hydrogen and uh, getting rid of CO2. Uh, that is uh, basically uh, being uh, emitted at the time of uh, this industrial usage. Uh, and this is the top priority. This is the low hanging fruit. This is the easiest uh, to, if we can say, or let's say the, the, the best way to address decarbonation is to tackle first industrial uses. Then will come power generation. That doesn't mean power generation, uh, so using fuel cell to generate electricity doesn't exist today. It does exist, but it's still minor. 
and uh, and uh, develop, uh, and it might come as a second step. Um, looking at the question. Um, Okay, good question from Philippe. Uh, do you think nuclear power will be considered by Europe as a source of green hydrogen production one day? And not only as a pink. Uh, want to try this one, Mail, or if you let me answer it? Do you think nuclear power will be considered by Europe as a source of green hydrogen production one day? It's a bit tricky one. Huh? Maybe let me give you my uh, opinion on that. So we're based in France, and nuclear is in, is very important uh, as a as a source of electricity in France. And uh, of course, uh, there is debate uh, about uh, this, uh, this such aspects and uh, how a decarbonized source of electricity such as nuclear uh, can be considered as green. And why we use the term green is uh, definitely. Uh, an easy easy aspect to remember, uh, we prefer to call that electrolysis and uh, and and using uh, so when the source of electricity uh, again the point we, we just commented before uh, it's it's uh, always the the challenge to have the cleanest way and the most the, let's say the least carbonized way to produce electricity. And I believe uh, that there is a uh, discussion at the moment uh, to integrate nuclear as uh, such a, a source to produce uh, hydrogen. Uh, the issue is uh, um, the, the, the challenge we have on the electricity market at the moment. And I think it's not the number one priority of uh, European institution at the moment to consider that, but it may come uh, in, in the future. Uh, because uh, it might become decarbon, might be called decarbonized uh, electricity uh, source, um, and I don't know if green will change uh, and use another color, but this is definitely a possibility. Again, it's country by country. Looking at other questions, um, yeah, I'll try to answer uh, the question from Arshal T. How much percentage? Utilization rate currently available from electrolyzers and their service life in years. So, in fact, the utilization rate um, is not, from the electrolyzer perspective, is not a problem. Uh, they would run 24 7. They are designed to uh, produce and generate hydrogen 24 7. But the problem relies in uh, electricity pro uh, furniture. Uh, but uh, these questions underline a very good aspect, what, uh, which is what would be the most uh, economic, uh, economically cost-competitive option? Uh, is it having electrolyzers running uh, all year long with very expensive electricity uh, or maybe using them uh, a bit less, um, even if it's a very expensive equipment, but use electricity that is less expensive to provide uh, extra input to this equipment. So these uh, questions have been um, tackled in a few studies. And even if cost of electrolyzers is still um, a very big importance of um, hydrogen costs, uh, it seems that using them maybe below 80% uh, with cheaper electricity is more interesting. And it also shows how important the electricity price is um, on this topic and uh, how much it impacts the price of hydrogen produced from electrolysis. And about their service life in years, um, usually in, uh, in other work, uh, we also use this abscess of uh, at least eight to 20 years of life cycle, meaning that on the time frame we used for this work, uh, electrolyzers will not be replaced. Uh, if they are installed in, 2020, in 2022, they will still be operating in uh, 2030. Uh, 
Um, looking at the other questions, we have a question about the water footprint of hydrogen production from electrolysis. So yes, as you understood, so the, this one is from uh, Fibos. Uh, of course, uh, you need water. and We split water to generate hydrogen uh, from electrolysis. And the issue is do we have sufficient uh, water sources uh, to supply electrolyzers? And uh, this cannot be done in any country. And we are thinking about the dry country. And uh, so first, uh, we have to consider the location of uh, the production plant and then the, the size and the usage of water. So this is uh, basically uh, done at the, um, at the design uh, of the, the power plant to secure uh, the water supply. Uh, nevertheless, it's not um, it's not something that will uh, deplete uh, 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 the water supply uh, from the city. Uh, it's still very uh, reasonable even for large installation. Plus, there can be combination also to use rainwater and purify this rainwater in order to supply the electrolyzer. So yes, it is a constraint. That is the question. Uh, but yes, it can be also addressed and uh, in a sustainable uh, way, uh, depending again on where the hydrogen electrolysis plant, uh, the water electrolysis plant is based. So it will depend on the country. Um, I'd like to address a second question from Harshalty. How much is water footprint from green hydrogen production? Uh, so one kilogram of hydrogen produced from water electrolysis requires nine to 10 liters of demineralized water, which means uh, it is around uh, 13 to 15 liters of uh, clear water. Uh, and then we have two questions from Muzaffer Basaran. Renewable energy is unpredictable. Therefore, in my opinion, the best way to produce hydrogen is from nuclear energy. What is your comment? Uh, it is my opinion. Uh, I think Fabrice kind of answered this question a few minutes ago, but uh, for sure, uh, having a base load, uh, low carbon source of power generation seems very promising for uh, producing hydrogen with using water electrolysis. But nuclear is a very political topic. So a few countries are targeting to phase out of this technology. And it is not yet clear that they will try to put it on the table again only for producing hydrogen. And the second question is, it gives the capacity of the electrolyzers in gigawatts, but there should be a coefficient of raw production as hydrogen ton per gigawatt. Yeah, in fact, we used uh, information we had on the electrolyzer's product from uh, the suppliers to convert um, this um, volume of installed electrolyzers into tons of hydrogen. And we used uh, first 100% uh, uh, utilization rate to get the most, the maximum value. And then we put in place a yeah, lower utilization rate due to uh, electricity furniture. I'm taking another question uh, from Mark. Uh, is it reasonable future scenario to equip industrial companies or industrial parks with electrolyzer and to produce their own green hydrogen for use so I understand, I understand locally. Uh, definitely, uh, this is a very viable scenario. Uh, hydrogen is difficult to transport. So that's the first key uh, element to consider. Once uh, you take this, uh, then on-site is the best solution. But uh, industrial sites are often uh, limited in, in terms of space. And you need to consider uh, both the electrolysis uh, uh, installation and footprint and the supply of those electrolyzers. Because if, for example, you want to implement uh, windmill or uh, solar panels uh, to supply the electrolyzer, that will be extra uh, footprint on the, on the installation. 
But definitely, and this is typically the best scenario today that is considered, is to have uh, the electrolysis on site for industrial company and uh, supplying directly the equipment. Um, checking other questions. Yeah, I'm reading through a questions from a few minutes ago. It's a quite long one from Jeremy Gask, but very interesting. Having in mind that around 95% of current uses of gray hydrogen is for refining and fertilizers, that are maybe not really industries compliant with post carbon wool and use of hydrogen in the power sector may occur in second phase after how to abate the industries. What kind of new uses would you suggest or recommend for green hydrogen? Um, so to answer to this question, uh, I will highlight one industry that is um, a hard to abate sectors and that have uh, an impact at a global level on CO2 emissions, which is the uh, steel industry. Uh, today, um, accounting for 7 to 10% of global emissions. And some projects are um, trying to produce steel uh, from uh, hydrogen to reduce iron ore. Uh, and they will call it green steel. So, this is a very promising um, usage of uh, or unuse of hydrogen to um, 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 uh, to scale up this industry because um, these manufacturing assets are um, very uh, important and it will create a very big market demand for uh, green hydrogen. Uh, it is also uh, the reason why um, the project uh, hybrid in Sweden have uh, put together industrials from act, actors from the whole value chain. So Vattenfall is a electric, as a electricity supplier, uh, electricity operator, um, LKAB, the iron ore company, and uh, SSAB, which is manufacturing um, steel. Uh, so these type of projects are very promising because they are proposing um, new technologies that could, um, for example, uh, create a new market demand for green hydrogen in a centered uh, location, but it requires lots of competences from and across industrial partnerships. So these projects are interesting, but they are very hard and long term and hard to uh, put together. Um, so at least uh, I try to answer with one example uh, to prioritize. Uh, today. Thank you, Mel. Um, we may take a few more questions until we finish this webinar. Um, one other question from Marshall is how much percent, percentage utilization rate currently available from electrolyzer and their service life in years? Uh, so the percentage utilization, utilization rate as uh, shown by Mel during the presentation uh, can vary a lot. Uh, it can be uh, depend on the supply of electricity. So you can have your electrolyzer uh, running when there is sufficient renewable energy, then switch off, then start again when the uh, renewable electricity is coming back. Uh, this is quite complex. Uh, so it depends on the renewable electricity. Those electrolyzers are usually a big system that need the better have a startup and shut down time. So uh, there is basically a configuration that needs to be uh, taken into uh, account, uh, technical configuration uh, before uh, assuming this on off mode. But typically we use that as utilization rate. So from renewable, there is a hypothesis uh, that uh, an electrolyzer can be on average supply by renewable electricity at the level of 40 something percent, uh, 43. Um, uh, and then uh, economically, because uh, then there is the other aspect is that you have an electrolyzer that has a capacity, a daily capacity. So your objective is that it runs as much as possible because this is an industrial asset and you need to maximize the, the usage of this asset. And if you use it 95% of the time, which is the best 
uh, that can be done uh, currently in the industry, then of course you uh, can get better return on your investment. So uh, ninety-five percent is the let's say the maximum uh, utilization rate that is currently uh, noticed, and the five remaining percent are mainly for maintenance aspect. And related to that, uh, second part of your question, service lifetime. Uh, so an electrolyzer uh, can last quite a long time. Typically, uh, you have to consider that there is uh, several elements and some of them needs to be changed over the full lifetime. The stack is one of them because this is the stack that typically lasts six to uh, 10 years, uh, depending on the technology, of course. Uh, but assuming that you need to plan for stack change and upgrade every uh, six to 10 years, uh, and you can have uh, multiple decades of lifetime for your electrolyzer. Any other question you see maybe mail that can be addressed before we close the... Yeah, maybe one last question from Walter Sival. Will your report also outline the cost now and in future per megawatt and the size weight of electrolyzers? So um, on this, institutions uh, have published reports on uh, costs of electrolyzers per megawatt uh, from a uh, time perspective. And uh, these costs, I uh, usually have a similar trend or uh, other energy technologies such as solar or wind. Uh, they will decrease over time with uh, the um, scale of production. But uh, uh, for hydrogen, we also compared these costs with information we gathered uh, from uh, companies selected here. Uh, and we also have yeah, sized weight um, volume of hydrogen per hour. Uh, of the equipment uh, proposed by all those companies. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I think we're reaching the end of our uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, sorry, we can't answer all the questions, but we will do uh, answer uh, to those uh, that have not already been answered. Uh, we can uh, contact you later on and, and uh, send you an email to answer your question. So we wanted to uh, thank you again, all of you, to, uh, for your participation and for those many questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye.